Morality. It's a word that represents one of the key components of being human, our ability to view the actions of ourselves and of others as being either good or bad, or just or unjust. But our sense of morality varies from culture to culture, society to society, and most importantly, from person to person. It's what defines our lifestyles, our laws, and outlines our perspective on the world around us. Morality, like many things in life, exists on a spectrum and allows us to have different takes on very divisive issues such as abortion, gun control, and environmental policy. But we aren't born with a set of moral standards. Our perspective on what is right and wrong is morphed by our biological dispositions, societal expectations, and influence from our culture and those around us. These standards also are constantly developing and changing throughout our lives as we experience different events and grow more as people. Psychologists have spent a lot of time mapping out this moral progression that we experience throughout our lives. So in this episode of Psychology of Gaming, the series where we see how game developers incorporate psychological principles into their games and how games can affect us psychologically, we take a look at the normal moral progression in humans and how it's put on display in David Cage's Beyond Two Souls. Morality is often discussed in philosophy, but that's more along the lines of defending a belief as being right or wrong. Moral psychology, on the other hand, is the study of how we develop our sense of morality and the different ways it takes form throughout our lives. Again, our morality and our morals are basically just our sense of what is right and what is wrong and the thought process that we use to achieve those beliefs. The most prominent theory on the development of morality comes from this fine man here. Meet Lawrence Kohlberg, a moral psychologist of the mid-1900s. After years of studying people of all ages, as well as related theories from past psychologists such as Jean Piaget, Kohlberg theorized that there are three stages of moral development that humans engage with throughout their lives. Now, like many things in psychology, this theory is very complicated, but luckily for us, using Beyond Two Souls, we should be able to establish a pretty decent understanding and examples of what Kohlberg envisioned. So, Kohlberg's first stage of moral development was called the pre-conventional phase, and he believed that this category was the first stage that we experience in developing our sense of morality and morals. The pre-conventional phase is mostly applied to toddlers and children up to age 10, give or take a few years. This is because this first phase is very much focused on the individual and how decisions affect our own lives. And if you know anything about children, you know that they are very self-centered and self-focused. Kids want things their way and they want it right now. And most of the actions they engage with are in service to themselves. Children do tend to have a sense of right and wrong, but unlike adults who define morality in a much deeper and meaningful way, kids tend to think about morality only as how their decisions affect themselves, not society or anyone else around them at all. The pre-conventional category is defined by that self-centered characteristic. What is right is what benefits the child, and what is wrong is what gets the child in trouble or in a dangerous situation. For example, a child can draw a picture on the wall and be punished by a parent with a timeout, and this teaches the child that the action that they were just doing, drawing on the wall, that that's wrong, and so they're unlikely to do it again because of the punishment. Children won't be spending a lot of time thinking about more abstract moral dilemmas because they are too young to understand them. But examples like the one I just mentioned show how children first begin to establish a sense of what is right and wrong, and this will later define parts of their own beliefs as adults. Now, I should mention that even though this phase is most common in children, adults too can use this level of reasoning acting on right and wrong based solely on how it affects themselves in any given situation. They don't really live with any principles or standards and will only act in a way that benefits themselves regardless of the consequences for other people. 
But for now, let's look at how young Jodie Holmes displays these characteristics in 2013's Beyond Two Souls. Now, if you haven't played the game, I suggest you do so before watching the rest of this video because, yeah, there's gonna be some spoilers. If you're sticking around, then let me set this game up for you a bit. Beyond Two Souls tells the story of Jodie Holmes, a woman who lives her life connected to a spiritual entity called Aiden. Aiden comes from a different dimension, but is linked to Jodie and is unable to leave her. He is also very protective of her. Jodie and Aiden's relationship is unique, as Jodie can control Aiden to some degree, but the spirit also acts on its own free will at times. As more and more people learn of Aiden and Jodie's connection to him, she becomes more or less a lab rat who is eventually forced to work for the CIA before escaping to carve out a life for herself on the run. The story is well worth playing and experiencing for yourself, but for the purpose of this video, I want to talk about three individual chapters, each taking place during different parts of Jodie's life, and those missions are My Imaginary Friend, The Party, and The Mission. The Imaginary Friend is the first chapter you experience when playing the game chronologically, and it shows Jody at a very young age, probably around 5 or 6, and certainly well into Kohlberg's pre-conventional phase of moral development. By this point, Jody has an awareness of Aiden and speaks with him openly, and I gotta say, from a narrative perspective, Aiden is brilliant. He is the ultimate silent protagonist and allows the player to assume his role and act how they choose without affecting the story's pace, themes, or tone. As we will see, Aiden allows the player to inject their own sense of morality to go alongside Jody's developing morality. So clearly, David Cage and his team at Quantic Dreams had a pretty good understanding of how we develop morally, and we see this throughout Jody's journey. Now again, Jody isn't dealing with any huge moral dilemmas here as a child, so most of her sense of right and wrong is outlined by her parents' rules and Aiden's temperament. This chapter, My Imaginary Friend, starts off with Jody blankly staring out a window, clearly upset that she can't play outside in the snow with her friends and live a normal life. After moving from the window, Jody is given the freedom to interact with items throughout the house, and I particularly find this interaction with her mother's makeup to be the most interesting. She begins to put some of her mom's makeup on when Aiden starts to spell out her name in the mirror. Jody reacts by saying, No, Aiden. Mom is gonna be mad if we mess with her stuff. And this really shows off her moral reasoning. By saying that Aiden's action will get them in trouble, Jody is admitting that she isn't viewing the action itself as wrong, but it's only wrong because it leads to consequences for her personally. Jody will get in trouble for putting makeup on the mirror, therefore it is wrong, it has a consequence for her. It's a very self-centered approach, and her sense of right and wrong is defined by how her actions will affect only herself. There are other examples too that you can find by interacting with stuff in the world, including stealing a cookie before dinner despite mom telling you not to. Eventually though, the mother will tell you to go outside and play for a bit, which Jody finds to be boring because she wants to play with her friends, not by herself. Whatever. It's not fun anyway. However, she hears kids playing outside the fence and uses Aiden's help to sneak out and play with them. It shows that Jody is still a kid and that rules aren't always comprehended and accepted when presented with a fun new opportunity, which is another characteristic of the pre-conventional phase. After another child attacks Jody with a snowball, Aiden becomes more aggressive and begins choking the other child, at which point Jody's dad shows up and drags her back inside. There, Jody is scolded angrily by her father. What were you doing in the street? You know you're not allowed to leave the yard. I saw the other kids playing. I, I just wanted to have some fun. What did you do to that boy? But Aiden makes his presence felt before the father can hurt her. Jody, this time you're really gonna get it, aren't you? Go to your room. Jody's reasoning of, I just wanted to have some fun, again shows off her level of moral reasoning. In that moment, she overrode her parents' rules and did something she viewed as being right or okay, which was having some fun, 
because that action resulted in her feeling happy. At this point, Jodi is certainly in the pre-conventional phase of moral development, but as she grows, she comes to the conventional phase. So, Kohlberg outlined the conventional phase as the second stage of moral development, and argued that during this stage, our sense of right and wrong is influenced mostly by the people around us, whether it be family, friends, co-workers, teammates, or society as a whole. This stage is mostly found in teenagers and young adults, as the human brain is still developing its sense of morality and what is right and wrong. You can think of this phase as certainly including things like peer pressure and adherence to social norms and rules, as young adults seek to find where they fit in. A sense of right and wrong doesn't come down to life-guiding principles in this stage, but instead towards the actions that will be approved by friends and family that leads to more social approval and acceptance. And this is certainly the position Jodi finds herself in during the mission called The Party that takes place during her teen years. At this point in her life, Jodi has been continuously experimented on and isolated away from people her age because of her link to Aiden. She has very little interaction with people her age, but she certainly craves it, even if it does give her anxiety. Maybe I shouldn't go. Jodi, you've been begging me for weeks. You're not gonna back up now. I don't know anybody there. They might all hate me and... This is awful. At the party, Jody meets other kids her age, and it quickly becomes clear that she is out of touch with teen pop culture and the rebellious actions that teens engage in. During the party, she is offered both alcohol and weed, and Jody can choose to use them if she so chooses. Regardless of what the player has her do, it shows that Jody's moral reasoning is in the conventional phase. If she chooses to engage with the alcohol or the weed, then she is giving in to peer pressure and defining an action as acceptable because it results in social approval from the other kids. If she chooses not to participate, we will still pick up on a sense of shame within Jodi for rejecting an action that would have given her social approval. We see a similar situation pop up later when Jodi interacts with Matt and can choose to dance with him or be peer pressured into it. Regardless of player action, Jody will succumb to Matt's desires to get her on the dance floor. She is influenced, and her actions are influenced, by those around her. Finally, we see the kids turn on Jody and begin to tease her and call her a freak for her connection to Aiden before locking her into a closet. The player is given the choice to either let Jody leave the house or to exact revenge on the other kids as Aiden. And I think this is another way that the game handles morality perfectly. Sure, we get to see Jodi's moral reasoning grow and change as she ages and experiences life, but we're also given the chance to put our own morality up for examination through controlling Aiden. In this situation, personally, I had Aiden act as a method for revenge against the kids, and I think that's because I connected with Jodi and sympathized with her plight. The kids were mean and took things way too far, and I opted to give them a taste of their own medicine. But do two wrongs make a right? No, and it made me think more deeply about my own ideas of right and wrong, and justice versus injustice, and how situations can influence our decision making. Personally, I find this to be the most powerful chapter in the game, and I think it gives us a very solid understanding of where Jody's sense of morality is during her teen years. And that's what allows us to better understand Jody as she grows into the post-conventional phase of morality. Kohlberg believed that this final phase, the post-conventional phase, developed as people begin to define principles for their own lives that may or may not align with societal expectations and the expectations of those around them. People in this phase have developed a higher ability to use moral reasoning to explain why something is right or wrong and will feel emotionally connected to those beliefs. It is in this phase that one develops their own rules for their lives and begins to reject some of the rules placed on them by parents and society as they view rules not as an absolute guide on how to live, but instead as an ever-changing set of values to live by. Jodi is certainly in this mindset when she experiences the events of the chapter called The Mission. 
At this point in Jody's life, she is working with the CIA as a stealth operative, and after three years of training, she is sent on her most exhaustive mission yet. Her task, as passed down by her CIA handlers, is to eliminate a warlord in the rogue country of Somalia. Jody enters the field, and in order to progress, she will have to kill some of the warlord soldiers. War is interesting, and the fact that we justify killing in the name of a greater cause or good. At least that's how those who see war as a necessary evil view it. The act of killing in any context is certainly a questionable moral act, but soldiers are trained to be desensitized towards killing in order to be more effective in combat. It's certainly a moral dilemma that Jody encounters, but she is able to rationalize her actions as kill or be killed, and that her actions are justified because the people she's killing are bad. Jody progresses further into the Somalian city and eventually encounters a young boy named Salim, who has seen the horrors of war ravish his home to the point that he is fully capable of using an assault rifle at the age of about 7 to 10. Jody, using Aiden's help, heals the boy and they progress further into the city as Jody protects Salim in return for guidance to the warlord's location. Eventually, they part ways and Jody has Aiden take over a soldier's mind in order to assassinate the warlord. In a bloodbath type scene, Aiden's controlled soldier mows down the warlord and all his generals and soldiers and Jody heads in to confirm the kill. It is at this point revealed that one of the soldiers killed was Salim's father, and the young boy is clearly devastated by the moral choices that Jody made. Salim attempts to kill Jody, but Aiden protects her. Jody clearly is very distraught by witnessing what she has done, and after barely escaping, she confronts her field handler Ryan. It is revealed that the supposed warlord was not a warlord, but instead the democratically elected president, and that the CIA withheld this information from Jody. She freaks out and jumps from the helicopter, enraged after what she has been through. I wouldn't have murdered him. So you lied to me. Welcome to the CIA, Jody. It's not fucking choir practice in case you haven't noticed. Now we had a job to do and we did it. End of story. This might just be a fucking job to you, okay? But I don't go around killing people because some four fucking star general tells me to. What difference does it make, Jody? You was a dead man walking with or without you. I have blood on my hands. Some kid lost his father because of me. Because I trusted you. Because I trusted him. We were doing the right thing. It is through this mission that we see Jody is rejecting a set of morals that society has placed for her, mostly that of the organization and obedience that is set forth in military structure. Her own experience has made her see that she was just a pawn, and those actions that she thought were justified were actually very wrong. She has blood on her hands now and will never forget what she saw in Somalia and it shows that she has taken on her own principles and perspectives towards following obedience to the point of killing. She is thinking about morality on a greater level and how she defines her own sense of right and wrong, regardless of what society and those around her tell her. With this, Jody has reached Lawrence Kohlberg's third stage of moral development, and I hope many of us do reach this third stage as it allows us to define our own lifestyles and choices without being slaves to societal norms and laws. If we reach this point while remaining kind to those around us, we have a lot better chance of thriving here on Earth. So that brings us to the end of today's video. Thank you so much for watching. Listen, go play Beyond Two Souls, especially if you like games with a good narrative. You won't regret it. If you have any questions about Kohlberg's theory of moral development, or want to talk about any moral issues, comment below and let's discuss. Also, please feel free to check out some of my other videos in the Psychology of Gaming playlist. Thank you so much for watching, please leave a like if you enjoyed the video, consider subscribing for more, and as always, have a nice day, and take care.